Hey everybody, this is Michael Campbell with Glasgow. Be sure to smash the like button and hit subscribe. So in the last video, I promised you guys we'd talk a little bit about AI. And I don't really use the term AI all that often, artificial intelligence. In instead, we actually focus on the word machine learning or ML. So with machine learning, there's all kinds of different kinds of machine learning out there because you know you have self-driving cars and you have robotics and all these other things. We're focused mostly on natural language processing. So natural language processing, you know, to a computer programmer, a language is Python, JavaScript, uh, C++. Uh, so in natural language is what a programmer would call languages like English, French, and German and Spanish. Okay, so that's why they're called natural language and natural language processing, NLP for short. So with machine learning, uh, doing the natural language processing, uh, there's some limitations that you'll come across. Now, first of all, if you want to get involved with machine learning, there's plenty of tutorials on YouTube all over the web, everywhere. So you can, you can learn for free, you can pay somebody uh, to get the basics down and whatnot. Um, there's plenty of resources available. But, you know, coming to resources, I'm going to talk about that in just a moment. If you want to write a script that does basically takes an input and gives you an output. I mean, you could actually write something just as short as two lines of code, and you can do it from a C prompt. You know, you can do it from any computer you're on. It's pretty quick, it's pretty easy. You just call up that, um, that bundled data set that somebody's already you know, built, you run the script, and it gives you some output. So this sort of thing is pretty straightforward. It really takes, there's really not much of a learning curve at all. You just need to know what you're actually looking for. So sometimes the output gives you numbers. It'll give you a number like 0.68 or, you know, and you have to understand what those numbers are, what the numbers represent. Um, it might be testing, you know, how effective the results are. So the, you know, maybe that number represents like how accurate uh, the results are because machine learning in general, it's not a perfect Fit. What it does is it gives you kind of a, a fuzzy, because what it's doing is it's, it's actually using the trained data that it was trained on, and then it takes the new data that you give it. So it's sort of like you're testing this system to see whether it can actually perform its job on data that it has never seen before. So it takes the training data and it does uses that as an example. For example, it has certain patterns in that data that it can kind of extrapolate, okay, from those patterns, I'm gonna apply these rules based on that data set on this new data that you've just given me, and then I'm gonna give you the result of what I think uh, is the best answer. And then when you look at the result as a human, and you look, hmm, not really quite what I was expecting. It's only like 70% accurate. So getting to like 90% accuracy is pretty tough in machine learning. And so there's a reason why people are, you know, hesitant to give you self-driving cars because, you know, mm, that percentage difference might be the difference between life and death. And so there are regulations, there's a lot of safety issues, especially in that kind of an industry. But with language, things can, they can give you rough results. So for example, you can go on to Google Translate and get a rough result. That translation might be good for this sentence, might be bad for another sentence, but what you're getting is kind of like a 90%, a fuzzy match. So a lot of the algorithms that we build in Glossica behind the scenes for like transcriptions and things like this have to be pretty much rule-based systems rather than machine learning based systems. Because, you know, if you're typing in an answer, we need to make sure that that answer is actually correct or wrong. And so if, if you come across a sentence that fails, we just have to go in and say, oh, there's um, something wrong in the code, we fix the code, and then we can release that update almost immediately. And so, because that's a rule-based system, there's not actually any machine learning based on that. So the machine learning kind of comes down to how we tag syntax. How do we, how do we tag sentences? And how do we tag semantics? There's those two things, semantics and syntax. And so when it comes to syntax and semantics, well, there are plenty of out of the tool, you know, out of uh, what do we call um, ready built solutions that you can just take out and write two lines of code and get some examples from. The problem with that is that that fuzzy match means that there's a lot of vocabulary in a language that actually fails when you go through that system. So when you, you can use off the shelf kind of things like BERT or, or Spacey, um, you know, there are some, a lot of variations on BERT itself. Um, but uh, what 
all of these things were actually trained on in the beginning is a data set called the Penn Tree Bank, or PTB for short. Now, if we go into the history of where all of these data sets came from, and we look at how these data sets have been used in industry, uh, let me just give you an example. Penn Tree Bank started with a group of linguists in 1993, obviously at the University of Pennsylvania, hence the name. Um, and now there's a linguistic consortium, where there, an, an online website where you can buy tons of uh, data sets that are available there. But um, short, long story short is that the, the linguists who tagged that, they were under a lot of pressure for uh, time, uh, delivery, and also budget. And so the, the final data set that they actually tagged, there's, they really, what they wanted to do was decrease the number of um, what we can call are the individual uh, elements in the tagged data set. So originally it started with like 150, 160 different kinds of tags. And they reduced that down to 47 tags to tag the Penn Tree Bank, what became known as the Penn Tree Bank later. So um, in that process, they cut it down to 47 tags. And those 47 tags are kind of limiting in a way because if I take an example sentence and I run it through the Penn Tree Bank test, um, there's going to be a lot of words in, in a single clause that may end up with the exact same tags. And that's just because they try to do this for volume and simplicity rather than for like deep syntax and accuracy and all these other things. So the problem with all of this though is that the Penn Tree Bank does not have like a complete coverage of let's say it, it, you know, it's specifically built for English, so it doesn't have a complete coverage of the English dictionary. And so when we're working at Glossika on building things out, we want to have a really good understanding of a uh, full coverage of the English dictionary, and that includes things like multi-word expressions or MWEs, and that's something that Pentry Bank doesn't handle very well. A lot of data sets in the world do not handle MWEs very well. So this is a, a major um, source of um, concern for us, and so we spend a lot of time and effort building our own data sets. And so we build our own data sets so that we can train our own machine learning algorithms. Basically, we're replacing what BERT or Spacey does by going back. We're, we're kind of like, you know, if you're a, a, a data engineer or if you're a data scientist. Now, the difference between a data engineer and a data scientist, we can talk about that a little bit. A data scientist is somebody who runs kind of tests and they kind of see how things work out and they play with stuff, play with numbers, they, they see how things work out. But a data engineer is actually somebody who actually builds product and delivers it to an engineering team or a developer team. And so there's an actual workflow between these two elements. So a data engineer is kind of what we're focusing on here. So a data engineer wants to build something that actually works, is a functioning product. Not really running a bunch of tests like a scientist does. Okay, so uh, what the data engineer does when he runs this test is that if he's just using the tools right out of the toolbox and he runs this test and he says, oh, okay, it gets like 80% or 90% accuracy. I think it's good enough that we can use, um, see if the, you know, the rest of the team, the developers and the testers can actually use this. Um, one of the problems though is that the data engineer does not actually know the, where the source data, where it was constructed and what was put into that data because a lot of that is, is not uh, it's proprietary or it's not open source, okay? So can you actually open up the source code in, in what it's delivering you? That's not always the case. And so if we go back to the actual data sets, because if we test that, that code or out of the out, off the shelf toolbox that they give us and we find that it's giving us a lot of blank answers or it's not giving us results at all on certain kinds of MWEs or other patterns, then we're concerned that is this a tool that we can actually rely on long term? And the other thing is, is that the syntax data that it gives back, for example, in PTV, is that it's not giving us the kind of scalable syntax or deep syntax that we want to be able to apply to all languages around the world, which is why, you know, we use sort of a semantic syntax, um, uh, kind of like an uh, inter... In, what, what's the proper word I could use for this? It'd be like the cross between semantics and syntax. So when you get deep down uh, behind the actual surface of what you see in English and you get behind that into the deep syntax, you realize that the deep syntax is, is describing what I'm saying, no matter in what language that I'm saying it, as long as I'm expressing the same idea, the syntax behind it, 
is almost always, 90, more than 98% of the time, the same. For example, if I, if I describe something like this chair or this wall as white or hard, that's going to be expressed the same way in every language. And so that's a final state. I'm, I'm describing the state or the appearance of this thing. Or if I move something from another from one location to another location, first of all, I have source location and target location, and I also have a causative stat a state verb. So that causative state verb is expressed, it's expressed differently in every language, of course, and in a different word order in every language, of course, but the this deep syntax behind it is the same from location to location, and there's an agent that caused that thing to change its position or the final state of that object. So as you can see, we can describe English on the surface. For example, I moved the book from the left to the right. However, when I express that in a different language, that surface rendering is completely different and unique for that language. So if I say it in Chinese, 我把这本书从左边搬到右边, that sentence in Chinese has a completely different syntax and grammar than it does in English. Now the grammar in English may match what is said in Spanish or French or maybe some other languages in the same language family. But as soon as you go out to other language families, it gets a little complex. But the bottom line here is that what I just said in Chinese in deep syntax actually has the exact same deep syntax that I said in English, which is basically there was a source location, there was a target location, and there was a causative verb and a change of state. And so that's what we tag at Glossica. We've built this from the ground up. There's just there's a lot of syntax and semantics that we, we use around 100 tags. So it's about double the number of tags than the pen tree bank uses. And now we've tagged, I think that this year we've done a million, maybe a million, 500,000, a million and a half tags, a huge amount of data that we've been tagging just this year. And that's just with our internal teams. And so what that means is that our data sets are getting much more robust and much more accurate and being able to tell us exactly what anything is being said in a sentence. And we find that extremely useful because that tells us the sort, it tells us the difficulty level of all of the uh, data that we're sending out to the user. So sometimes you might be using Glossic and you might say, man, why am I getting this sentence at this location? And we may be asking the same question ourselves. We say, why did that sentence get into that you know, sort position? And we're working on updating that on a consistent basis. And we're also working on making sure that our tags are as accurate as possible and training that machine learning behind the scenes to be able to uh, really, really improve on all of this. And another thing is, you know, maybe that sentence is supposed to be presented at that time and at that location because of its, its relative difficulty or its relative structure in relation to other sentences. Now, we're also experimenting with other things in, in terms of sentence length and that sentence length can affect beginner users and so if you get a too long of a sentence at the beginning even though its internal structure is quite simple these are things that we're really working on and trying to improve um, and so all of these things that we do in the background they don't have to be hundred percent accurate because you know machine learning doesn't really get to hundred percent accurate so we divide all of our um, data into different into two different things. It's what needs to be 100% accurate. For example, user input. We need to be able to detect that and be very accurate about that, or transcriptions. The other thing is like the tagging system behind the scenes, that doesn't really affect us that much, but it does make the product really good if the tagging is really good. So it doesn't have to be 100% perfect, so machine le learning is actually excellent for this job. And so when we do that, um, you should, and we keep improving it. It's kind of like you're using Google uh, Translate over many years and it keeps improving. And so in the beginning kind of gave you pretty good rough results, but you know, 10 years later, it's actually doing a much better job. And so that's kind of where we're focusing and putting the machine learning into play. With that said, um, I'm actually excited about developing out Glossica Python packages. Um, you know, it's still early days. Like, I don't know when we're gonna get there and how much more data we need to work on, but I think that developing that out for many different languages will also help other companies in technology industries be able to solve their problems in NLP, or natural language processing. And so, in some underserved languages, like maybe there's, I don't know, maybe there's a company out there that does need a solution for 
Kurdish or maybe Chinese dialects or other Chinese languages, you know, I don't know. But if we are able to actually build those solutions out and provide a, a viable solution because we have a business need ourselves within the company, who knows, maybe other companies will also find that valuable and uh, a good solution to their own needs as well. Thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, please follow up and, and give us your responses. That's our update for this week. Signing off. Bye.